At least we're all awake. <laughs> and we know that we are in a war. Did you try it again? You saw it break? That's bad news. Can you see there on that screen? Whew. People want to know He saw it break, he said. We serve a mighty God. He just wanted to demonstrate it, right? Thank you, Lord. We appreciate it. That makes me feel better. It's an improvement? Wow. <laughs> you know, some people want to know, why am I doing this? Why am I saying these things? I'm saying these things because I believe with all my heart that we are before the final event. I'm saying these things not to hurt anyone into the, in the church or around the church or outside the church, but I want you to be established in present truth and to set your face like flint and to be so settled in the truth that you cannot be moved. That's the definition of sealing, by the way. And that is why I'm doing these things. And the conflict is going to become stupendous. It's going to be a mighty conflict. And there will, people, there will be people that say that the Advent message is a message of separation and is not welcome in the time that we live. And there will be people that will develop a new eschatology for the church. And there will be people who will develop a new message for the church. That's not our job. We're supposed to be anti-typical Elijahs. And I'm so glad that Francois did the message that he did, or gave the message that he gave, because we never even spoke to each other. We didn't even have time to speak to each other. Because I was at La Sierra today. God is good. He's very good. And, uh, and there is some dovetailing between what he's said and what I will say. How do I know that we are not off the mark when it comes to the message? It's such a strange message. It's such a hard message. And the message is, worship him. The hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the sea, the earth, and the springs of water, and everything that is here. Worship him. The hour of his judgment has come. Why do you think there's such a war on the issue of creation? The devil doesn't want anyone to worship him. Why do you think there is a war on the issue of God's law? And God's authority, and why in particular the Sabbath? Because the Sabbath is the commandment that gives validity to the entire Ten Commandments. If you take the Sabbath out of the Ten Commandments, the law is written by Joe Schmo. It means nothing. But it says there, Creator, Yahweh, Heaven and earth. Jurisdiction. That's the lawgiver. Only with that stamp in the law can the law legalize the entire Ten Commandments. So the Sabbath commandment is pivotal. It is the law of authority. It, it touches the very heart of the lawgiver. 
So if you take the Sabbath out, you don't have a law. Anybody could have made it. If I made a law and I gave it to you and I commanded you all to keep it, you would say, <laughs> I would if you made a law and told me I must keep it. But this is God. And there's another entity that says, no, 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 not that law, my law. So there, there is a war. And Adventist eschatology says that this law will escalate and culminate in a final conflict between the authority of the man of sin and the authority of God. And the whole world will wander after the beast and give their power and authority to him. So this is a universal issue. The whole world ripening in apostasy and choosing the authority of one over the God of the Bible. And all of this authority, with everything that it entails, is all locked up in the issue of a day. Isn't that brilliant? And then people say, but, you know, couldn't it be different? I mean, that's not what the evangelical world teaches. That's not what the Baptist world teaches. That's not what the other denominations teach. Why should this sect be right and everybody else be wrong? Isn't that a good question? Now, can typology help us to understand the plan of salvation? Can it help us to understand eschatology and to see if that which we have been preaching, because we're not just a church, we are a movement, if that which we have been treating, teaching is in harmony with the typology. Typology can become the tool which verifies our eschatology pertaining to end-time events. Now, there are people who are not of this faith in this audience, and they have these questions, and they have the right to have them answered. And isn't it legalism to lift up the law? What about grace? So I want to talk about these issues tonight. I start with this picture. It's quite a nice picture, but it has an error in it, which I find most irritating. What is the error? The horse. I don't think Moses elevated himself and galloped about on a horse as the great ultra leader. I think he had a staff and he was walking with the people. Don't you think so? Okay, so let's not be too dramatic. Let's look at the typology of deliverance. And we'll see many points where Francois and this lecture will dovetail. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Come out of her. Here was a syncretism or syncretistic religion that was practiced, because the Bible says that the father of Abraham worshipped the moon god as well as the god of the Bible. It was syncretism. And he was called out of Ur. And Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. They, the first call to Abraham, he came out with his father, and they only got as far as Haran. And there they stayed until his father died. His father didn't go all the way. <laughs> and then he got a second call. There were two calls. 
Arabur. That's a typology. And he had to go all the way to Canaan. And he was a sojourner in Canaan because the Canaanites were in the land. He didn't even get anything. He wandered around amongst all the people. And people think, you know, it was a primitive society. Look at this. I took this picture in the British Museum. This is jewelry from the ladies in Ur, solid gold. No woman today, not even the queen, is decked or like these women were. And Sarai, who later became Sarah, was absolutely stunning. She was a beaut of beauties. And Abraham passed through the land under the place of Sichem, under the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. So he was a sojourner. He didn't get it there and then. He'd never got it in his lifetime. But it was promised. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord. What is that? That is soteriology, as my friend would say. He was preaching the gospel in type. Because that altar that he built always had to be built out of unhewn stones. Because it stood for the character of Christ which needed no hewing and squaring. It was perfect. Whereas the stones that went into the temple were to be hewn and squared before they went into the temple because they represent you and me. The Bible says you are stones built into the temple. We had hewing and squaring, but it was forbidden to hew and square these stones. Of course, the Israelite transgressed that because the other nations had hewn and squared uh, altars, and uh, thereby they destroyed the typology, and God was angry. Righteous indignation. And so he preached the gospel in type, and he pointed to the Lamb that was on the altar that would take away the sins of the world. And then he went on to Bethel, the house of God. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So here was someone amongst pagan nations preaching the gospel. Who does it represent? You. Everyone who is called out of Babylon, religious confusion, and stays amongst the people, not in a monastery, is called to do this. And Abraham journeyed going on still towards the south, and there was famine in the land, and Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in, in the land. Did God say to Abraham, go down to Egypt? No. No. He never said it to him. But there was famine in the land. It was, it's tough out there. And so he went down to Egypt because he was looking for a Walmart <laughs> or a Safeway. And he needed some soy milk. And Sarah was not very happy with uh, what they had amongst the Canaanites. So off they went. And it came to pass, when he came near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. I like the New King James Version rendering. A woman of beautiful countenance. In typology, who does she represent? She represents the church. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister. Was he lying? No. He was uh, half lying. It was his half-sister. It was his half-sister wasn't his real sister. 
But his offspring, Jacob, he lied when he said that his wife was to be his sister. <laughs> she was his cousin. She wasn't his half-sister. But here, he wasn't really lying. I always tell the story of how we bend things. I get so many phone calls. And I get so many emails. And sometimes I just don't want to anymore. It's very bad of me. And then uh, my wife says, the phone's ringing. And I say, I don't care. <laughs> and then she answers it. And she says, that's me. And then she tells me who it was. And I feel bad. And so off I went to the bathroom. And I climbed into the bath with my clothes on. And I climbed out of the bath. And I went to the phone. And I phoned him. And I said, sorry, I didn't answer the phone. I was in the bath. <laughs> That's pretty stupid, isn't it? Well, that's what he's done. I've done it myself, and I think it's stupid. Of course it's stupid. It's pathetic. But it made me feel better at the time. Pray that this is my sister. And it came to pass when Abram came into the land of Egypt, she was very fair. And all those eyes went... And she was so beautiful that they even didn't dare touch her, but told Pharaoh... And she took him. Hmm. And he treated Abraham well for her sake, and he had sheep and oxen and asses and manservant and maidservants and she asses and camels. He had the whole bit. The latest model camel. He had them all. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. Excuse me, help me here. Who is the sinner here? Abraham. Abraham. Who else? Sarah, she's going along with us. Here are the ones who are really at fault. Who gets beaten up? Pharaoh. Now, this story tells us something about grace. God sees the intention of the heart. He knows who wishes to be Christ-like and wants to follow him with his whole heart. But God also takes our weaknesses into account. And he didn't accredit it to him as he should. Pharaoh, on the other hand, has no connection with God. He feels nothing about this. And God still has Abraham's problem at hearts. And he doesn't treat him as he deserves. On the contrary, he knocks Pharaoh and Abraham has all of this substance. Well, finally, Pharaoh finds out and he says, why didn't you tell me it was your wife? Why did you say it was your sister? And he said, well, I, I was afraid. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him his way and his wife, and all that he had. He didn't take any of his substance away. He walks off a rich man. What a deal. <laughs> That's salvation. God doesn't treat us as we deserve. He treats us with kindness and grace. And in the final analysis, when we are taken away from captivity of an antitypical pharaoh, we go away with great substance and walk on streets of gold in the light of God's countenance. Isn't that beautiful? All right, let's look at the story just a little bit further. Sinusrit III was the fifth king of the 12th dynasty. Here's a picture of him, and there's his Kadush. And uh, he was the ruler. His mother didn't have any elastoplasts, so she couldn't stick his ears back when he was born, so this is what he looked like. And uh, 
he was a co-ruler with his son, Amenemet III. So there was a ruler and there was a co-regent. And at this is the time when uh, Ab Abraham was in, in Egypt, the exact time. Now, Sinusrit was this king's birth name, which means man of the goddess Wasret. We have a ruler, we have a co-regent, we have a female deity. Now, in this issue of plagues, and why God plagued this Egyptian king, is the law of God in any way bound up with this issue, yes or no? Yes. Which commandment? The seventh commandment. So here is an illicit arrangement. So we have the transgression of the law, and as a consequence of the transgression of the law, we have plagues. Here is the co-regent, Amenemhet. Here is the promise. Now as for every son of mine who shall maintain this boundary, which my majesty has made. He is my son. He is born of my majesty. The likeness of a son who is the champion of his father, who maintains the boundary of him who begat him. Now as far as for him, who shall relax it and shall not fight for it? He is not my son. He is not born to me. So here, this king was very proud of his son who was to maintain his boundary. Good. Abraham leaves there and says to God, Whew, thank you, Lord. I'm never going to commit that sin again. I'm never going to do something so stupid in my life again. Climb in a bathtub and tell somebody I was just never. I'm not going to do that. And off he goes to the king of Gerah's land, and Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, She's my sister. Aren't we just as stupid as that? We do the same things over and over and over again. And Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will kill me on the count of my wife. The same thing happens. This poor king gets knocked. Then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, male and female servants, gave them to Abraham and he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And then he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus she was rebuked. So in his heart, do you think he wanted to be a liar? No. But he showed weakness, human weakness. So he has this propensity and wish to do well, but he is weak and he fails. Who does that represent? Me. Does God say, you miserable failure, <coughs> sizzle fits? Does he do that? No. We serve a wonderful God. We serve a God of grace. And look what he says about Abraham. Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So it wasn't in his heart. Abraham believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. He came out. So if you come into this church, people who have come out of Ur, don't expect perfect people here. They're not perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. He didn't even have any of his own righteousness. It was imputed. Everything we have is the issue of grace. Now, there was a typology. It was God's law that was at stake. There was a king. There was a goddess. There was a co-regent. 
and uh, there was a deliverance by plagues, twice. Now let's go to an antitype of that, which adds more detail, and then another antitype and another antitype, to see whether our final eschatology is in harmony with all these previous typologies. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? This is Tut Moses III, the greatest pharaoh of all times. Greatest pharaoh of all times wasn't Ramses II. He was far too late. I know that uh, Hollywood would like it to be Ramses, but it wasn't Ramses, it was this man. Ramses is too late. It's after this pharaoh that even the Egyptian kings changed their religion from polytheism to monotheism. Here was the greatest upheaval where Akhenaten took the name Akhenaten Aten and wrote a psalm which is almost similar to one of those that Moses wrote. Which deity did he begin to worship? And then they were all eradicated, that entire group was in, eradicated and when the Egyptians went back to polytheism then only did Ramesses come and that pharaoh Tut Moses III had a co-regent Amenhotep II who was not truthful he said all is well in my kingdom and all is at rest when he actually threw a tantrum after coming back from Syro-Palestine, finding his father dead, the army gone, the slaves gone, his firstborn dead, he went through his country on a rampage and lopped off many heads of those of his own country who thought didn't do their job properly and hung them on his barge and sailed them down the Nile. Nothing was well in your kingdom, nothing was at rest, it was total chaos. And here is the tomb of Tutmosis III, the pharaoh of the Exodus. And in it they find the mummy of Tutmosis. But Harrison Weeks do some examinations and find that this is a mummy of a 20-year-old. When uh, Tutmosis was as old as Moses, he should have been in his 80s. So there's a fake mummy. Maybe the, the original one uh, got lost somewhere in the Red Sea maybe. Now I went into this tomb and I know there are other fantastic, fantastic pictures in this tomb which we haven't got God or we will have to go back to get them. I took this one myself and I was fascinated with this picture. Here you have a priest and we have the sun disk on his head. So this is a priest of Rehrakti and here he is holding a staff and it's almost like he's going phew and it uh, becomes a serpent. Where did you see something like that before? Isn't that interesting? In this man's tomb? And there you have some worshippers. And this is the tomb of his son. And there you have the goddess, Isis, giving him life, the young. And written on the walls, as in Tutmosis' tomb as well, you have the great book of the dead, the Umdayat, the religion of these people, and this very book, this book of the dead, is the highest source for occultism. It's used in the occult world. This is the basis of the religion of the high initiates. Fascinating. So what was then is now. Nothing has changed. The book of the dead, what does that mean? Because this religion was a, a religion of the worship of the dead. Ancestor worship. The whole of Eastern religion, the whole of African religion is ancestor worship. The whole of Catholicism is ancestor worship. Don't you pray to the saints and to all of these? The main deities involved in this religion were Cyrus and Horus and Isis. And this guidebook, the Umdayat, was written by Tutmosis III. He was a fascinating pharaoh. In his time, 
before he also ascended the throne, there was a female pharaoh who ruled, who was first the daughter of another pharaoh, and her name was Hatshepsut. And she's the one who found Moses and made him Pharaoh's daughter. And she was one of the great female deities, or uh, pharaohs. I'm not going to go there. But this man was raised, this, this is a Cyrus, but his antitype, his living form, his reincarnation, if you like, Tutmosis III was raised by the priesthood. So he was a priest king. Typology, ding. Priest king. This is the god Anubis, the god of mummification. He receives the soul to the netherworld. Now it's very fascinating that this great king, the greatest of all the pharaohs, at some stage had his rival Hatshepsut murdered. I'm not going to go into those details. And so Moses heard that Pharaoh had died. But the other Pharaoh was still ruling, who had been made co-regent. And he became mighty and uh, ruled for a long time. And he made Reherakti, the sun god, the number one god in the Egyptian pantheon. That's fascinating. Now you must put this all together. Here you have a pharaoh. He's a priest king. He's a priest king. And he elevates the sun god, Reherakti, to the number one position, and he displaces the god Amun, who was the number one deity. So we have a change of religion. All the Egyptians always raised up two obelisks for their deities, if you were. But here, for the first time, one obelisk was to represent this new elevated deity, Reherakti. And he had a pillar fashioned, which he didn't manage to complete because he had an unfortunate accident in the Red Sea. Here we have Tutmosis III dedicating a temple to the god Reherakti. Later, Tutmosis was worshipped and he was deified as an incarnation of Reherakti. So he was a priest king and he worshipped the sun god and he was deified. He was a god king. And afterwards Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do you, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get ye unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the land... Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you, Moses, make them Shabbat, keep the Sabbath, and rest from their burdens. Get you to your burdens. He makes an anti-Sabbath law. Great typology. What would God's answer be when the Pharaoh makes a anti-Sabbath law? Plagues. Blood, frogs, lice, flies, cattle, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, firstborn. And four of those are the same as the final seven plagues. Do we have a link in our eschatology between this event and the final event? We have a pharaoh. He's a god king. He has a system of worship which he devised, which is a system of worship, of worshiping the dead. It's a dead cult. Everything revolves around death. Fascinating. Was there a female deity involved as well? Isis. 
And she was the mother of Horus, who always sat on her knee. So we've got the full catastrophe right here in Egypt. And then he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness, and he gave them the lands of the heathen, and they inherited the labor of the people, that they might observe his statute and keep his laws. Praise ye the Lord. Is the law of God involved in this eschatology? The transgression of the law. So we've had two now. The one was the transgression of the seventh commandment, twice in a row with Abraham. And here we have the transgression of the fourth commandment. And this is an antitype of the previous type. It's in perfect harmony. And again, there are plagues. Do they come out with great substance, yes or no? Typology. They come out with great substance. Let's go to another type. Let's, let's put in a few and see where we go. The Ark of the Covenant in the Temple of Dagon. Here is the priest of Dagon, the fish god. And this is the story, and you can read it there in 1 Samuel 4, 6. I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to tell you the story. You know the story. The Philistines and uh, the Israelites are at war. And the Israelites are losing to the Philistines. And they say, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant and then we will win. So they bring the ark, and there's great rejoicing, and uh, the Philistines say, their gods have come that caused all the trouble in Egypt. Oh, may our gods help us and be brave. And off they go, and they fight, and they give Israel a beating. Why was Israel beaten then? Because they trusted in the object rather than the God of the object. Isn't that so? And so we often trust in the things of the Lord rather than in the Lord of the things. And the story tells that they took the Ark of the Covenant captive, carried it, and put it into their temple before Dagon. And what happened? The next morning, there was Dagon lying flat on his face. So they lifted him up again. And the next morning, they get there, and what happened? Gadufi, there he lay again. But his head was off, his hands were off, and there was the stump. He was broken in three parts. And then they were plagued, and the plagues broke out. And as the custom was, they made models of the, of the sores and the creatures that cause plagues like the rats, and they put it on, and they put it on this cart, and they put two cows that had just birthed in front of it, and they tied their calves down, and they said they will run to their calves. But if this thing is from this God, this thing will go back. And off it went. We were just at the place. Fascinating. All right. Is the law of God involved? Because where is it? Inside the Ark of the Covenant. Can I take God's law and put it into the temple of another deity making it subject to another God? Yes or no? No, that God could just end up flat on his face, and if he doesn't watch it, he could break into three parts. Isn't that right? Okay. And uh, I haven't got time for the rest of the story. That is the priest of Dagon. That's what he looked like. He had the fish mitre on his head. And the Philistines took the ark and brought it into the house of Dagon. And there it is, and we don't have to go into all the details. Another typology. File it in your minds. We'll come back to it. Now let's go to another typology. We're going to put in a whole few. In each one, so far, there's a law of God. There are plagues. 
And uh, we'll see how it continues. Elijah and the prophets of Baal and Asherah. Asherah. Francois just showed Asherah and Asherah poles. And Asherah poles were phallic symbols. They referred to, he actually said it, the phallus erectus. That was an Asherah symbol. Well, let's go there and have a look at the first Elijah. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Do we have a king? Yes. Do we have the commandments of God, the law? Yes. And here was drought, and they were following Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. All right, we get a little bit more detail. We have a king. We have a woman. Huh. We have two sets of prophets, one of them representing a female deity, Asherah. And she has a symbol, which is a phallic symbol. And we have a woman, and her name is Jezebel, and she's a Phoenician princess, and she is responsible for bringing sun worship into the Israelite camp. Sun worship. So we have quite a few parallels with what we had before. And again, the law of God is at stake. You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. The first commandment. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. That's a very common thing. People don't answer. This conflict, syncretism, two types of worship, in one people. Do we have it in uh, our ranks, yes or no? Yes. So this message separate. But of course this message is also a message to the world. How long do you want to halt between two opinions? If Baal is God, well then worship him. And he's the sun god. And his day is the same as that as Reherakti, the day of the sun, the venerable day of the sun. Now, this comes from the web. I probably, you probably recognize it. Played the role once. Now, when Yehu, you know the story, eventually the prophets of Baal are all killed and uh, the people choose. We'll talk about this issue a little bit more tomorrow when we talk about the latter rain. And uh, eventually... This issue is resolved, but this woman, Jezebel, she scares the wits out of poor old Elijah. Eventually, of course, the issue is totally resolved and uh, all things come to an end, and then Yehu at one stage comes to Jezreel, and Jezebel heard of it, and she put paint on her eyes, and she adorned her head, and she looked through a window. Now in Revelation chapter 17, we also have a woman who is decked with all kinds of decorations, don't we? And then he said, throw her down to the eunuch standing up there. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot, 
And when he had gone and he ate and drank, then he said, Go now, see to this accursed woman and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. So they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull, the feet, and the palms of her hands. Three little heaps. Cliff, cliff, cliff. Three little heaps. Fascinating. File the typology. Let's go to the second Elijah. Francois spoke about him tonight, and I was pleased when he spoke about him, because the picture has already been painted now, because he spoke about Aretas. And it's the second Elijah. The disciples of Jesus asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. So that's one of the jobs of the anti-typical Elijah, is to restore religion. The first Elijah came to restore religion and to set it in its right frame. That's the job of the Elijah message. And John the Baptist was to prepare the people and restore the religion to its right frame. But I say to you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not but have done him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is an antitype of the typical Elijah. And this is uh, the place where the baptisms took place and what was his message. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he had a message of repent, restore the old waste places. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way for the Lord. He has a message of preparing people for the coming of the Lord. That's the Elijah message. So he had an advent message. Did he keep the seventh day? So he had a seventh day Advent message, didn't he? And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair. Please note, he didn't have a garment of camel's skin. It was a garment of camel hair. It was a woven garment. But it was one that the the poorer people wore. And a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat, his food, was locusta and wild honey. That was not locust hop hop. It was locusta, the carob bean, the carob pods. That's why the carob pod to this day is known as St. John's Bread. So he was a vegetarian. Did you get my drift here? He was a vegetarian. <laughs> then went out of him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around about Jordan. He was on this highway that Francois spoke about. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Was he meek and mild? Not particularly. Was Elijah meek and mild? Didn't he say, uh, why don't you sing a little bit louder? Is your God deaf? Maybe he's on vacation. Perhaps he's relieving himself. I mean, that's pretty sarcastic. I'm not saying follow his example. We should learn from their mistakes. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Don't think you can be saved by your lineage. Don't think you can be saved by your affiliation to any religious society. You are saved by grace and nothing else. Not by your theology, 
not by your affiliation. Am I saying we don't need a theology and an affiliation? No. For say, I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abram. For Herod had laid hold on John, bound him, and put him in prison for Herodias' sake. Ah, thank you, Francois. I don't have to go into great detail here. His brother, Philip's wife. And John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. Is God's law at stake in the Elijah message, yes or no? It was at stake in the first Elijah. It's at stake in the second Elijah message. The first Elijah said all the commandments. You have not kept the commandments. This one again brings out the commandment of adultery. This is the third time we've met this commandment. God is very serious about a faithful relationship between himself and his bride. Spiritual adultery is the main problem underlying all the other problems. Isn't that so? So it's fitting that these commandments should be lifted up. But the issue is all the commandments. But we have a king. His name is Herod. Is he an adulterous king? Yes, he's an adulterous king. Has he got a wife? Yes, Herodias. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask, and she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. Okay, we have a mother and we have a daughter. At the end of time, will we have a power which says, I am not a widow, I will not suffer lots of children? Will we have a power like that on the planet? Yes. Will she say, I am the mother of all the churches, and the other churches are my daughters? Will she say that publicly? So she had a daughter. Who's dancing before the kings of the world? Herod stands for the kings of the world. Is it now the mother in this eschatology or is it the daughter who is doing the dancing? The daughter has got the mini skirt on. And she's pleasing Herod. Okay. In the antitypical scenario, who will do the dancing? Catholicism or Protestantism? Protestantism. Eschatology, typology, is our typology and our eschatology in harmony here, yes or no? Yes. There's a law. You cannot violate typology with your eschatology or else you have violated an important biblical principle. This is Mukavir where John the Baptist was beheaded. And uh, my friend Francois has the habit of dragging me to all these places. <sighs> my life is very hard. Now let's look at an antitype. The little horn power. He will think to change times and laws. Daniel 7.25. Is the law of God at stake? Yes. yes. Will he be boastful and say, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? Yes or no? Will he have the gall to change God's law? Yes. He'll say it. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. You all know these texts, but we're looking at typology. 
Does he fulfill that typology? Yes. The Pope's will stands for reason. He can dispense above the law and of wrong make right by correcting and changing laws. When the Pope was in your country in 2008, he says that the laws are based on natural law. And natural law is the main philosophy of Roman Catholicism, and it is that which is logical to introduce, and he, by his reason, can do it. It is, by his reason, easier to change God's law than to bring the whole world up to the standard of God's law. And so the Pope has changed God's law saying that he's elevated, Pope Benedict, his elevated position makes him capable of overseeing more than any other being on the planet. Whew, he sounds like Nebuchadnezzar. He said that. And then he said grace can only be dispensed through him. And every single church must realize the succession of Peter. And if you don't fall in line with that, you're a trouble. You're not a sister. You're a daughter. You will listen. Did the present Pope say those things, yes or no? Yes, I can put all those quotes on the screen I want. Who's the Lord that I should obey his voice? Mystery, Babylon, Revelation 17, the woman rides the beast. You know, God doesn't want us to hang around Revelation 17. He says, come here, come to Revelation 12. I'll put you through the car wash and you'll look a little pale and you'll keep the commandments of God, but I don't want you to be decked like that one sitting in luxury, riding the political powers of the world. Come up, be separate, hold to the testimony of Jesus, and keep the commandments of God. This comes from Baal, back where we took this picture, and you thought that the miniskirt was a new invention. There, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. She was a prostitute then and she is a prostitute now and she has the golden cup in her hand. And it is the only church on the planet that has a golden cup in its hand. These are the priests of Dagon with the fish mitre on their head holding the little bucket of holy water and the little branch of hyssop with which they spray the people. And this is the headgear of the priests of Dagon. And who is the present-day priest of Dagon? The papacy. There they are in the Pergamon Museum. There's the symbol of the sun deity. And when it has these wavy lines underneath, it's the principle of femininity. There's a female deity involved here. So you have the religion of Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace. There's no such thing. Who has received grace, who has found favor. Only the Douay Bible translates it full of grace, so she becomes the grace dispenser. That is robbing Christ of his supremacy. And so the priest of Dagon and the priest of Dagon today are one and the same. Does the modern-day priest of Dagon say that his law is subject to his authority, yes or no? Yes. In other words, he's put God's law in the temple of Dagon. Doesn't he wear the mitre of Dagon, yes or no? He wears the mitre of Dagon, so he's a priest of Dagon, and he's put God's law into the temple of Dagon, claiming that it is Dagon's law, the sun god's law, because he says, keep Sunday and not Saturday. Looks like they're all priests of Dagon.
Let's go to the Vatican and have a look. It's built on an old pagan site like all the temples and all the cathedrals are built on pagan sites or ley lines or any one of those. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? So does this power receive worship? Yes, Pharaoh was deified. He was a priest king. Is this one a priest king? Yes, he actually plays a double role. He is a priest king and he claims a bride as priest king. But he's also a woman because he's a church. So he hits both typologies. This is brilliant. And as the woman, he has a daughter. <laughs> Fascinating. And his symbol is the dragon which was also the symbol of Rome. This is one of the taken in the Vatican. So he placed God's law in Dagon's temple, claiming it as his own law. Now let's have a look at this system of sun worship. Here are all the quotes, all the references. This is just plain history. Of all the pagan cults, that of Mitra, was the most formidable rival of Christianity in which it exerted a noticeable influence. Many of the current practices come from Mitraism. The 25th of December was the birthday of Mitra. The first day of the week dedicated to the sun was his holy day, as opposed to the Jewish Sabbath. The Mithraics also practiced baptism with the blood of a bull and a confirmation and expected salvation from a Eucharist Last Supper. The Mithraic ethic, like the Christian, was an aesthetic and pure. So they had a law, and they had rules, but the, the rules were, of course, contrary to God's rules. Fascinating. This god Mitra has a love relationship with the eagle. <laughs> What's your symbol? And he has a golden cup in his hand. And he's slightly effeminate. He also has this funny little hat on, which is the Phrygian hat, which is also in the center of your military academies. It's the symbol of your military. So who's your military working for? But forget about that. Mitraism had seven grades. Uh, when you reached the final grade, you were called father, and you got a congregation. Which church today has a priest called father and serves a congregation? Only Roman Catholicism. Now let's have a look how the sun worship came into the church. You can look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica or... George Vanderman also wrote about it. The Jewish war of A.D. 66 to 70 aroused tremendous anti-Semitism in Rome. It was not confined, confined to pagans. Everybody hated the Jews. The same thing happened with the second Jewish revolt in A.D. 132 to 135, ignited by the emperor Hadrian himself. He was planning to build a heathen city on the ruins of Jerusalem. In AD 135, at the conclusion of that war in which many Romans perished, a furious Emperor Hadrian issued a decree to outlaw Jewish worship, particularly their Sabbath keeping. So here was an attempt to outlaw Sabbath keeping. There had been an attempt before, but here it came again. This was a tremendous crisis for Christians who felt compelled to divorce themselves completely from their Hebrew heritage. Edward de Kock writes, he's a historian, in the second century the Romans changed their weekly calendar. Oh, now it gets fascinating. Which pharaoh changed the pantheon of gods? 
Remember? The Pharaoh of the Exodus. Let's see what happens here. The traditional sun god, Apollo, had not been the chief god. Jupiter was the chief god. And so the second day was dedicated to the sun. But now because of Mitraism, the sun god had grown more important and the week was revised to make Sunday the first day of the week, calling it Dear Solace, Day of the Sun. And so Sunday came into existence. So who made Sunday here the law? Rome. Rome. The Jewish wars had caused this revolt and the crisis and the Christians. And, and so the Christians in Rome decided to move from the seventh day to the first day of the week, contrary to God's law under pressure of these Romans. This was the first anti-Sabbath law that the church had to face. At that time, believers generally were still observing the seventh day and according with one of the Ten Commandments. And in the rest of the world, they still kept the seventh day, except in Alexandria, where they also switched then to the first day. Interesting. It was argued that if pagan Romans could shift the sun's day from the second to the first position, then surely Christian Romans could move the Lord's day from the seventh to the first. The fateful decision to bring in regular Sunday keeping was made in the time of Telesophorus, 125 to 136, and so it came into being. Here's the Encyclopedia Britannica. It says an early example was the demand by Pope Victor, 189 to 99, that all should celebrate Easter on Sunday. So now we have another switch. Easter has to be celebrated on Sunday. Fascinating. But the Pasch was never celebrated on Sunday. Or sometimes, if it fell that way, but it wasn't necessarily on Sunday, he went further. He excommunicated the Christians in the Roman province of Asia who continued observing it on Nisan 14, the day of the Jewish Passover. They insisted on following a calendar that God himself had instituted more than 1,500 years before, Exodus 12, 2. Indeed, they were stressing the crucifixion rather than the resurrection. Who argues today that we are celebrating the resurrection and therefore we must keep Sunday? All the churches. For this reason, they were derisively labeled as quattrodecimans, fourteenth, after the Latin word for fourteenth. So the other Christians didn't go along with this. They were excommunicated by this pope. Kenneth Strand writes, the majority of the Jews and the early Christians followed the theology of the Pharisees, calculating this date according to the Hebrew lunar calendar from year to year, both Nisan 14 and 15 fell on different days of the week depending on how, where the moon stood. But the papacy said, no, we will celebrate it every time on the Sunday because that's what the Sadducees used to do. Fascinating, not the Pharisees. Paul says, I'm a Pharisee. He wasn't the Sadducee in his theology. Fascinating. Because the Sadducee says it had to be after the weekly Sabbath on the Sunday, but the Pharisee says, no, it was reckoned from the ceremonials and from the date which was Nisan 14, and that was determined by the moon, so it could follow on any day. So here was a great conflict which developed. The theologians later at Nicaea also applied another anti-Semitic rule. In order to prevent the festival from coinciding either with the Jewish Passover or with the celebration of the Quattro Decimans, special provision was made should the full moon actually occur on a Sunday, to defer the celebration of Easter until the next Sunday. So they said, we will never celebrate it on the same time as the Bible said. We will always celebrate it on the Sunday, but should the biblical day also fall on a Sunday, we'll postpone it by a week. We want nothing to do with the Bible. It's fascinating that Pope John Paul II 
2001 shifted Easter with a week because they happened to coincide. Isn't that interesting? The Pope shifts the calendar just as he pleases. He will change times and laws. And what did the rest of the Christian world, all the Protestants, everybody do? Went along with it. Papa said so, we must do it. They had the same story in the Jewish Encyclopedia. And it says it was a difference between Sadducee worship and the other worship. Now, by the way, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. Do you remember the arguments that they had? They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. So they obviously didn't believe in demons. But they believed in the spirit world. So when you died, you go to heaven or you go to hell. You go to Abraham's lap or you go to the hot place. Who believes that today? The whole of the Christian world. And they keep the Sunday. But that's not what God taught. He taught death and a resurrection. And Paul said, I'm a Pharisee. And he threw that curved ball and they nearly ate themselves up, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Later then, Constantine becomes a so-called Christian and he makes a Sunday law on the venerable day of the sun. Let the magistrates and the people residing in the cities rest and let all workshops be closed. That was the edict of Constantine. But Hadrian, before him, had said the Jews may not keep the Sabbath. And the Christians had moved to Sunday. Now the Catholic Church, being entrenched, decided to take this a little bit further. A.D. 321. So in A.D. 360, just 39 years thereafter, they modified it a little bit. And they said, Christians shall not Judaize, keep the Sabbath, and be idle on Saturday, Sabbath original, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day they shall especially honor. Council of Laodicea, Canon 29. They claim to be the heirs of Constantine. Here is the new Roman emperor, the Pope. And he makes an anti-Sabbath law. Who else made an anti-Sabbath law? Pharaoh. So we have a God king who claims to be God because he takes the authority of God. He even literally claims to be God. Lord our God, Pope Leo, they crown themselves. So here we have a God king. It is a priest king. He has a bride. He is an adulterous king. He is also a woman. He has a daughter. He fits the whole gamut of the typology. Let's go to his main church, St. John's Lateran. There he says, Imater Ecclesia, the mother of all the churches. I have daughters. They will dance before the kings with their mini skirts. Now, you know, I like the detail of the Bible. Do you remember Tut Moses had a obelisk constructed but he died before he could erect it well his grandson erected it inscriptions state at this very main church of Rome this is the first church not the Vatican that used to be the residence of the Pope St. John's Lateran is number one by the way in the occult world when they refer to St. John, it's an acronym for another kind of worship, an esoteric worship. Inscriptions state that while it was begun during the reign of Tutmosis III, this tremendous obelisk in Rome came from Egypt, and it was the very one that Tutmosis had erected or made for the sun god Reherakti. That Moses made it, but it lay in the craftsman's workshop for 35 years and was finally erected by his grandson, Tut Moses IV. The only single obelisk ever put up in Karnak Temple. It was removed under the order of the Roman Empire Constantine, who hoped to raise it in his new capital, Constantinople, but he died 
before he could do it. His son and successor, Constantius, had it taken to Rome, where it was re-erected in the Circus Maximus. So it wasn't erected in front of the church. It wasn't a symbol of the Roman Catholic Church yet. It was still a Roman alone obelisk. And then guess what happened? At some unknown date, by some unknown cause, the obelisk fell. Kadoofy. And it broke. This trick tickled me, and I wondered, I wonder into how many pieces it broke. So I did a little bit of searching, and I came up with it. Tallest obelisk in Rome, and the longest, largest standing ancient Egyptian obelisk in the world. Weighing over 230 tons, originally from the temple of Amun in Karnak, brought to Rome by Constantius II in 357 to decorate the spina of the Circus Maximus, found in three pieces. <laughs> What do you say, Francie? My heart was? Thank you. And restored approximately four meters shorter by Pope Sixtus. And there it is. It was a rainy day when we went there. And uh, there is the Kadush of Tat Moses III. Mitraism, the religion of Rome, is nothing other than the Reherakti religion of Tat Moses III. And he has this love relationship with the eagle, which is the symbol of all the political entities. Interesting. And there's the eagle also as a symbol of the Pontifex Maximus in Rome. And there is the obelix. And you will remember that Tat Moses wrote the Book of the Dead and that his worship system was the worship of the dead. But the Bible says that God is the God of the living and not the God of the dead. In Roman Catholicism, you worship before a crucifix where a dead Christ hangs. When you say the Mass, you worship before the host, which is the body of the dead Christ. It is the worship of the dead. He is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. God forbade the veneration of the dead. There shall not be found any amongst you that maketh his son pass through the water, or through the fire at least, divination, an enchanter, a witch, or a necromancer, one who consults the dead. Forbidden! Because this was demonology, but not according to Sadducee theology. You were just speaking with the spirits of the past. In Catholicism the same. Anyone who came into contact with a dead person or a grave was considered unclean and could not take part in temple worship. Doesn't mean that he couldn't bury, but God made in his sacrificial system, in his system of worship, in the sacrificial form pointing to Christ, he took that away. He said, Lazarus is sleeping. Not dead, sleeping in Christ. Whosoever touches one that is slain with a sword or dead body or a bone of a man or a grave shall be clean, unclean seven days. Wasn't allowed to take part in temple worship. Say to the priests of Aaron, they may not be defiled for the dead. Let's go to a Catholic cathedral. What do we have there? They're all built on pagan sites where the dead were venerated and employed as mediators. And every Catholic cathedral is a burial tomb. It's a tomb. When you walk in, you walk over the dead bodies of anybody. They like to have the prominent people there. Under every single altar, you have this. I was giving a lecture in London. Ooh, I'm not going to tell the story now. Yeah, why not? There are plenty of priests in London. I was preaching in London, and one of my own brethren said, not a brethren, one of the pastors says, oh, please, they don't have relics and bones under the altar. And I said, yes, they do. And he says, oh, no. You know, they have such a lovely accent. <laughs> and we were going past St. Albans, and I said, can we go in there? I just want to see what it looks like. We'll take some pictures. And as we were going in, there was this procession, and this priest was taking a group round, and I said, come, let's go and listen. 
And he says, oh, this is this, and this is this. And then he came to the altar, and he says, oh, this is the altar. And I said to him, excuse me, could you please tell me, whose relic do you have under the altar? Not for my benefit, but for my friend's benefit. And the man said, oh, yes, we have the arm of St. Albans under the altar. So I said, and why do you have the arm of St. Albans under the altar? And he said, oh, we cannot say the Mass unless we have a relic under the altar. I said, oh, thank you very much. Nothing more. <laughs> and we walked outside, and the, and the man was strangely quiet. <laughs> so as we walked to the car, I nudged him to see if he was still alive. And I say, what do you say now? And he looked at me and he said, strange, very strange. Yes, I've crawled under many altars and I took this picture of this relic under one of the altars. And every single altar has a dead person or a corpse when you're walking in. And there is the guard of the dead, the skull and the bones. In this particular place, this was in Rome, they decorate the walls with the dead bones of the monks. And you can pray here and you can touch the bones because Roman Catholicism teaches the transference of merit. These people are holy. They dedicated their lives to service. Therefore, they did more than is necessary to go to heaven. That means they have excess merit. But a poor fellow like me who, you know, stumbles and falls and doesn't do all of these things, I just fall short. I can't go to heaven. So I can pray to them to give me their additional merit so that I can go to heaven. And the Pope has the power to dispense merit, and he can sell merit as an indulgence. But he never runs out of merit because should he run out of merit... If there aren't enough people in heaven from whom to claim the merit for all the masses that lives today, he has the power to claim the merit of Jesus Christ and give it to you. Can you believe that? I used to believe that once. I can't believe it. Now this power, this end-time king, does he have a co-regent? Yes, there's a beast out of the sea, there's a beast out of the earth. Does the first power, the papacy, this priest-king, does he receive worship? Yes. Where do we read it? And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with them. Will he make a decree that must be contrary to God's law? Why must it be contrary to God's law? Because the typology tells me it must be contrary to God's law. Isn't that so? And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So the beast, the first one, who has all the attributes of the little horn, who is Rome, has a mark. And he says, Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of observance is proof of that fact. So he makes a decree. When he makes this decree a universal decree, if in the type the decree led to plagues, what will the universal decree of his mark lead to? To plagues. Does he have an anti-Sabbath law? Yes. Christians shall not Judaize, but be idle, and be idle on Saturday, but they shall work on that day, but the Lord's day they shall especially honor. Now we've dealt with this, but I'm just doing it again to reinforce you that our theology is not just an arbitrary theology that means nothing. It's based on sound biblical principles not only supported by current events and by prophecy, but undergirded by typology. There has to be a transgression of God's law involved. Now, when he makes this law and he makes it binding, does he not break the seventh commandment? 
Is he not being unfaithful as a bride, a woman, to the God King, yes or no? Yes. He's an adulterer. The seventh commandment is there. Does he break the first commandment? Absolutely. He's chosen another deity, Re Herakte. He calls him Mitra. And he has a Mitraic system of worship. And he worships the dead. It's a cult of the dead. And that's not biblical because we serve the God of the living. We are served, saved how? By our obedience as Abraham was? Because Abraham obeyed my commandments and my laws? Or was he saved by grace? He was saved by grace. And we must never forget it in case we wish to be legalistic. Now, there is a mystic alliance called Babylon, which has how many components? Three. A dragon, a beast, and a false prophet. When Dagon fell over, how many bundles were there? Three. When Jezebel was consumed, how many bundles were left? Three. When the obelisk of Tut Moses fell into how many pieces did it break? Three. When Babylon finally falls into how many pieces will it break? Three. So the threefold alliance of false worship is broken apart and falls before the ark of God. And the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and the great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the wrath of the fierceness of his wrath. Is our eschatology biblical, yes or no? Now, wouldn't eschatology, putting some male antichrist who has nothing to do with Jesus Christ, who doesn't even qualify as a bride, would that fulfill a typology as we've had in the Bible? Never. Never. So the Elijah message, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Malachi 4. Francie was so sweet to say that I'm the Elijah. No, you are all Elijah. You have the Elijah message. And I'm glad to be part of the Elijah message. So I won't rebuke him, I'll just put him in the greater context. We're all Elijah. We have a message. Make straight the way of the Lord. You are Adventists. We rebuke kings. Did Elijah rebuke kings? Yes, come back to God. Don't serve the beast. Come, do what is right. Get rid of your brother Philip's wife. It's not your wife. Get rid of her. So the typology of Egypt, is it fulfilled in the final analysis, yes or no? When, say, when Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are many, and you make them rest. Keep the Sabbath. So the three angels' message is the end-time Elijah message. The everlasting gospel and the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the springs of water. And everything is aligned against it. Everything. You have the whole scientific gamut. The philosophy of origins is not science, it's faith. You don't negate science through not believing in evolution. All you negate is the philosophy of origins. Science still remains science, which must be proved by empirical evidence. But it dethrones God as the creator. Babylon has fallen. Anyone who has a system of syncretism, anyone who worships the beast and chooses another deity over the deity of heaven and chooses to obey another set of norms set by the man of sin becomes part of Babylon. So if a whole church signs the ecumenical charter, it has become part of Babylon. If a whole church says... I cannot wait for the Pope to be my spokesman. 
Didn't even pagan churches say that, or pagan religions? At the United Nations. And the final warning is, mark of the beast, obey God's commandments over the other commandments. Did the Israelites remain in Egypt while the plagues fell, yes or no? Come, my people, enter into thy chamber, shut thy doors about thee, hide itself, thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. We will be here. There will be no secret rapture. rapture. And then I saw another sign, and the plagues fell. And the seven last plagues fall. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. If you choose God, you will be safe. And if it seems evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's nothing wrong with our eschatology. Don't let yourself be duped into believing that we can have a new eschatology and one which embraces all of Babylon. I love this text, Revelation 11, 19. Look at it. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the what? The ark of the testament, the law. And there was lightning and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. What's that? That's the final plague. The final plague. Will the issue be God's law, yes or no? Yes. Is the theology of the founders and the pillars of this church, is it sound, yes or no? Yes, we don't have to be afraid of it. But some love the praise of men more than the praise of God. I want you to be established in present truth. We have not believed fables, but we have believed the very oracles of God. And Jesus Christ is coming soon, and we need to be established on the grounds of prophecy. We need to understand the plan of salvation. We need to understand it's not by my goodness and my merit that I will be saved, but by His grace, and that I want to keep His commandments in my sphere, and He will enable me in His sphere. And if we get this picture straight, we won't appear judgmental. We will be kind to one another. We will uplift one another, not tread one another down. And we will have unity in truth. May God bless you. Amen.